Hey guys, it's Christian from Lost in Discovery and welcome back to my Rhythm of War read along. We are up to part five, the final part, knowing a home of songs called Our Burden. I'm just going to call it the Sandalange because this was an epic climax and there is so much to talk about. Now, fair warning before we get into the video. I wrote notes as I was reading, as I always do, and the list is extensive. Like I wrote so much, so many reactions as I read this. It might be a struggle to fit all of them naturally into this video. So if I didn't mention a specific moment that you're waiting for me to talk about, please let me know in the comments and I'll chat to you about it there. All of these things that happen in part five have given me so many ideas for videos, so many implications for the rest of the series and the Cosmere. And we're going to dive into all of them in due time, but let's just talk about my reactions and the big things that stuck out for me in part five. And this is gonna be a fun one because it was insane. So sit back, relax, and let's talk about it. So part five started with Yasna and Dalinar for the most part, right at the beginning. And I was really, really happy to see them again. I loved Yasna's chapter with Wit, and I love seeing what their relationship is like. I've read that Brandon Sanderson has said that Yasna is asexual, and it was really cool to see the perspective of a character like this. And I haven't seen really much of this in fiction, maybe one or two cases, so it was really cool to see Yasna's perspective on her relationship with Wit. It seems like Wit wants a more typical um, relationship, but Yasna is really in love with the intellectual side, and it makes so much sense with Wit because Yasna would get so much stimulation talking to Wit and everything he knows. Oh my god, like, yeah, their conversations would be amazing. And it's interesting to see Wit, like, very kind of swooning over Yasna, very romantically involved with her, and yeah, it was a nice insight to see how her perspective of the relationship differed to Wit's. And it kind of shocks me that Wit being this like all-knowing wealth hopper has not really encountered anyone like Yasna, but you know, it's, I believe it. So it was, it was very, very interesting chapter. Wit mentions that he could have become a god if he wanted to. So could he have actually taken up a shard and he's just um, thrown that opportunity away? I feel like we kind of did know that already, but hearing him say that was very interesting. Yes, now moving on to Dalinar, I really, I just love the man that Dalinar has become. Like he has so much respect for me because he has grown and come so far, especially from where we've seen him in the flashback chapters in Oathbringer. Now, I love that conversation that Dalinar has with Yasna and he's thinking like, I remember, He's, he's re remembering when Kaladin was stuck in the chasms with Shallan in Words of Radiance and how Teft and I think it was Sigzel were waiting for Kaladin to come out and Dalinar had no hope. He's like, guys, Kaladin's dead, like, but I respect you for waiting. You guys do what you have to. But now Dalinar's like, I get it, man. I know that it seems like Kaladin should be dead right now, but I believe in him. And it was such a nice callback for him to have that internal dialogue. I loved that. I loved the dynamic between Dalna and Yasna and Yasna's whole conversation about the topic of hope and how it's kind of like counterintuitive and all her examples are so like they make so much logical sense but you have this kind of side of you that's very human and filled with emotion that kind of argues against that and I love when Yasna brings that to the table it's so damn interesting you can't really argue with her for a lot of the time even though Dalina finds so much of a frustration not a frustration but like a struggle to understand or to fully be on board with what Yasna believes and what she's pushing the fact that he still wanted her to write the undertext in the book that Dalinar is writing. It's like just so much growth from Dalinar. He wants to unite everyone and he wants to provide that balanced perspective that someone like Yasna can bring. And that's the way to do it. Because if you want to get everybody, the whole world on board to an idea or to unite, you need to have voices from all different perspectives. And I love that Dalinar is at the point in his life now where he is very comfortable doing that and knows that that's the right path. And it's just like, I love it. It's really good. Okay, let's jump to Kaladin. And Kaladin's story kicks off right from the get-go in part five. And I love that when they needed to find clothes that David comes back with Bridge 4 uniforms. And I'm just like, I just knew like this was going to be good when all the boys were putting on their Bridge 4 uniforms. I'm like, let's go. And when Kaladin is like walking down, he's like, I'm not going to be stealthy anymore. I'm just walking down real nonchalant. And everyone can be screaming and running and looking at me, but I don't care. 
and he's thinking like he's going to face his death and just his internal monologue was just the epitome of being a badass. When he meets the pursuer, I'm pretty sure unanimously, like all of us here right now on this video watching and reading this book, I don't think any of us were disappointed with the showdown with the pursuer. If you were, let me know. I'd love to hear your thoughts, but dude, this was amazing. Kalanen was trash talking the pursuer so hard and it was so good because Kaladin is just like in pure effort mode like he, do, he does not care like he has no more f's to give and it was so good to see Kaladin just so dumb and not in the way that's like a very depressed and sad way where you see him crumbling and you just want to cry it was like in the way that he's like screw you guys I'm going out in a blaze of glory, and I love that side of Kaladin. Every fight Kaladin has, he always has some good one-liners, but he was just like spitting bars this whole time with the pursuer. <laughs> My favorite part was this when it said, I am death itself, defeated one, Kaladin said, and I finally caught up to you, and I was just like, Whew, all right, let's do it. And I know I'm skipping ahead, but when Kaladin lashes the pursuer's face to the ground, and it just rips off and explodes that's what i want <laughs> like that's what i want more of in Stormlight. amazing but let's bring it down though because in this part we have one of the saddest maybe the saddest moment in all the series and that was this scene that happened with teft and like i'm not over it like i cried so much but it was such an honorable death even though it was so tragic but like the way moash shows up it's like my heart sank because I knew like, I knew like this was going to be it. Sanderson was about to punch me in the gut. And even when Lyft got cut and her legs were rendered useless and you see Calvin's parents gagged and he kills um, Tef's spren. It was just so brutal, man. It was so terrifying. And just the final moments between Moash and Teft, probably one of the most glorious hero deaths I've ever experienced in like any work of fiction just because Tef's last words like at least I'll die knowing I'm loved he's just come so far and I, I'm gonna get sad I'm gonna get sad talking about it it's like I can't I'm not gonna give you a play-by-play -play. like you all read it but his final words and how courageously he stood up against Moash at the last second and held his head high even though there was like horrific things happening yeah R.I.P. Teft. A great way to show that characters can die in this book and maybe not enough main characters die, but this one hit me harder than some main characters in other series, so yeah, that death was very, very impactful. And just seeing Kaladin find Teft and just the description of him holding him and wailing, just like the sound, like the moan sound that Sanderson describes and how all of the fused are just standing there like in respect because like they're like this is messed up yeah what a what an amazing moment like depressing as all hell but like incredible moment for the series all right let's cut back for a sec and let's talk about what's happening with Navani in this part Navani and Ravonio it's like been bubbling for so long and we're finally getting to the climax with these two it was incredible and I loved seeing Navani Again, another character just spitting bars and trash talking during the section. Amazing lines from Navani here. When she outsmarted Raboniel and basically blew her up, it was so good. But I didn't like enjoy it in such a way that I enjoyed Kaladin ripping the pursuer's face off. This was difficult because Raboniel was so well written and Raboniel was so sympathetic. I have a major soft spot for Raboniel and I pretty much see her side completely. It was a big moment, but I wasn't sure how I felt about it. I was like, oh my God, just, just madness. And Raboniel took it like such a champ. She's like, all right, <laughs> you got me. I want us to win, but if you have to win to like end this war for good, here's what you gotta do. And that was amazing. And then Moa shows up. <laughs> and the, the line from the internal line from Navani, I feel like is the fandom. If there was a God, if the Almighty was still out there somewhere, had he created Moash? Why? Why bring such a thing into the world? And I'm like, yeah, I know, right? Well, because it's awesome, because it's great 
It's a great story, that's why. The showdown between her and Moash and her getting stabbed, just her bonding. I know I'm skipping ahead, I'm sorry I'm going all over the place, but her bonding with the sibling was amazing. And when she goes, journey for destination, you bastard. And it was just beautiful and Moash is blinded and I skipped right to the end, but yeah. That was amazing. Just the moment, the last moments between her and Raboniel, and they were trying to sing together. They were one of the main highlights of this book, and one of the main highlights of the series for me. They really stole the show here. It's easily the best antagonist in, in the series. Th no question for me. Raboniel was fantastic. And yeah, another line from Novani to Raboniel was when she was like, next time try not to be so trusting, like just spitting it back in her face. And I just know that even though Raboniel was like stabbed everywhere and couldn't move, she was like, damn, girl got me good. <laughs> even as they're fighting each other to the death, Raboniel and Navani are working together and the way Raboniel is just clawing at Moash. The visuals in my mind for that scene were so grand and epic. Okay, let's jump back to Kaladin and this is where Kaladin is at his absolute lowest point. They've taken his dad, they've killed Tef. He goes on a murderous rampage and that's yeah when he rips the pursuer's face off and it is wow it's powerful and he goes up to the top of Erythru. He jumps man, he just jumps and he's like the way it was written how it called back to him in the chasm in the way of kings that he didn't jump and now he is. <sighs> oh my god like it was so heavy. It was, we, did you guys feel this as much as me? Like I felt this so powerfully. Now I can't say like I was truly concerned. I was for a moment that Sanderson was gonna kill him off, but like I didn't think so. Like there's just more to do with Kaladin. I didn't really think that Sanderson would do like the suicide ending for him. It's yet to be determined, but I just, I didn't think that, but that didn't matter. That didn't change how much this scene affected me because it's like, we know Kaladin so well at this point. And just the fact that he was actually going to commit suicide at that point hurt so much. Even though you kind of knew like he wasn't going to die. Just the fact that he was pushed to the point that he would do that was tough to read. When Dana comes in as the storm father and gives him the vision and we get the vision of Tien. Hands up if you cried, because I cried so much reading that. I basically bawled like a baby. How it was like adult Tien and child Kaladin, and that he hugs him and he gives him the wooden horse. And that comes up later when they find things in the chasm. What's that about, Sanderson? I, I don't know. The way he says the fourth ideal, that he accepts that he can't save everyone. And the way he comes down to save his father and the giant shield of Windspren that block out the storm. If this ever gets brought to the screen, that is gonna be one of the most impressive visuals I'm calling it right now. The way that Liren had the Shash brand to show support, like he finally came around a bit, like I still can't stand him, but like good on you Liren, you finally came around a little bit. And the way that Kaladin finally disappears, he doesn't see himself as a slave. It was just so touching and really well written, and I loved that entire sequence. One of my favorites in the entire series. I, I'm sorry for jumping all over the place, but it's kind of going to be like this in this video. Then we get to the cool stuff. I love we had the touching moment, but then Kaladin's like, I've got amazing armor <laughs> made from Windspread. That's shard plate. And that final sequence, how we jump back to Adam, that kid, and we saw his dad fighting as well. But we jump back to Adam, and he thinks he has shard plate now, but it's just Kaladin like ordering the plate to protect different people. It was so damn cool. Like that was so damn cool. And just the possibilities for fight sequences in the fifth book we're just like going crazy in my mind knowing that Kaladin can do stuff like this now. Amazing, amazing, amazing. And he's still healing. It's not a magic button that his mental health is now fixed now because of the fourth ideal. Good, of course. There's still so much healing to do with Kaladin, but he has come a long way in this book. I loved how slow and solemn and introspective this book was with Kaladin. And I loved how deep the struggle was. Like I felt like we were clawing inch by inch each chapter with Kaladin. And to get there in the end, it took me it took me right back to the Way of Kings when he jumped across that chasm 
and became radiant. I just love Caledon so much. One of the best characters I've ever read. You know who else shined in this section so much? Relaine. And I'm so happy that Brandon has kind of made him like one of the big characters, one of the main characters you could say in the story. And he really stood up in this section. He took control. He was sick of being in the background. He's like, all right, I'm going to bridge the gap. You guys don't like me. You guys don't like me, but I'm going to bring you together and we're going to do this. And just the whole thing of Renarin picking the Spren to bond with Relaine, like, man, it was just so satisfying to see him get you know, get some of what he deserves, get that respect. And God, just think back of when he was Shen in Bridge 4, like so much progression, so much development. And I loved it. I love seeing how far he's come. And I can't wait to see what happens next with him. Let's cut back to Dalinar and what he was going through here. His meeting with Isha was crazy. Isha is another Herald and continue with, continuing with the theme of being insane. This whole sequence was amazing. I love seeing how overpowered Isha was, fighting off the radiance, draining their stormlight, doing experiments, bringing the Spren into the physical realm, and the images of, <laughs> of the cryptics with like intestine head. And Dan, I was like, what is this abomination? <laughs> I'm laughing now, but it was truly horrific. Like that chapter was crazy. Seeing Zeth absolutely go off and chipping Ishar's blade with night blood. It was so exhilarating this whole chapter and Dalinar was trying to be really cool about it and trying to break through and trying to create a bond and all this stuff. He really held on a long time but eventually he was like dude this this guy's crazy like we gotta move on. So much information in that section that we'll have to dissect later but yeah that was really interesting. It started setting up Zeth's backstory and I'm like so ready for book five and I'm pretty sure we're getting Zeth's backstory there. Just knowing about the honor blades and all these hints about Zeth's dad like it seems like his family is way more important then we're realizing, yeah, his interaction with Isha and the Heralds, like he is so shook and I, I just want to know what all that's about. Yeah, I want to know more about that. Oh my God. But let's talk about perhaps the biggest thing, Taravangian, of course. This scene with Zeth and Nightblood and Taravangian was 10 out of 10. Like this wasn't crazy. When, <laughs> I don't, how do we talk about this? Like I'm trying so hard to be like presentable. It's really hard because even a week later or like a few days later, whatever, it, the hype is immeasurable. When Zest thinks he's killed and Taravangian is like ascending, the overlay of numbers and equations and everything, it's all coming to him. He's like, oh my God, this is the moment. I planned for this. It's all come to this. Long story short, he kills Odium with Nightblood and takes up the Shard. And he is now Odium. And Cultivation is like, hey, kind of planned this, kind of gave you this power so you could kill him eventually. And I'm just like, what? <laughs> what? What is happening? Oh, I can't talk. I can't talk. But yeah, this moment was amazing and I loved it so much. And I got scared so badly when Taravangian starts getting like high on the power that he's feeling like I could see everything I could do anything I could use my abilities and even cultivations like oh did I is was this guy the best choice I don't know and look what makes this so good is that for me personally Odium or Raze the guy who was Odium was a great villain for the series but we didn't have that connection to him. He was just like a god. It was just so big, you couldn't engage with it as much as you could if that god was Taravangian because we have all that development of him, that constant back and forth with him, with Dalinar and the, and the deal that Dalinar has made with the previous Odium about the battle in 10 days, oh my god. And I personally have a, such a bigger investment in that whole showdown now because it's Dalinar and Taravangian as opposed to Dalinar and Raze or Odium. It's it's better now. It's more personal and it's way more interesting. Now, someone who I haven't talked about too much in this chat is Venli, and she was like, you know, the main um, the main flashback character of the story, but she took a little bit of a backseat in this final part. But I love that she finally showed Leshri, like, look, I've bonded a friend, I'm becoming radiant, and Leshri's reaction of being so happy about it made me so happy and it was so good. Fanley, you know, still has a long way to go 
and still isn't perfect. Not everyone is perfect and she's growing. The, the most important thing is she's growing and I love it. I felt the frustration of Relaine when she wasn't coming to help and all that, but I like where Venli's character is going. I like that they're finding this old group of listeners. The moment when she saw her mum again, like, come on, that was amazing. And they've got like some connection with the chasm fiends now, how it just like walked overhead. They seem to be like on the same side, some sort of understanding. I was reading very quickly, so <laughs> I didn't fully understand what was happening with the chasm fiend there, but it's very interesting to see that there are actually still partiality out there. I just kind of want them to find peace. Let everyone else, the fused and the singers and the humans sort it all out, but I want these partiality. I just want them to go back to the days how it was with Esh and I. And speaking of Esh and I, <sighs> that final chapter, it just, fi it just fixed all my, it just, it just, wrap things up so nicely because I found her death in Words of Radiance so tragic and just finding her body on the floor in Oathbringer was just like, like if you wanted to go for like the whole war is pointless and there's tragedy like that and it all kind of means nothing vibe, yes that's good but it just felt like Sanderson wouldn't do her so dirty like that and this final chapter and how it led from the Stormfather saying, Dana, I've been merciful in the past and going back and seeing what he did for Esh and I in her last moments of life and showing her the whole planet and everything she wanted to see this whole time. I cried. I cried a lot and it was so touching and it was such a more fitting end for Esh and I. Gave her the respect she deserved and good on you Stormfather because he saw it too. Like Esh and I is a gem and even though she went off the rails towards the end, she's still the same person at heart and that end for her was beautiful. It was beautiful. Now, moving on to the big thing I've not talked about yet, Shalan and Adolin in Shadesmar. I feel like the climax of Shalan's story had already kind of happened in the previous part where she finally let go of Vale and all of that, but we got a lot here. I love that she just gave the finger to the ghost bloods. She's like, I'm done with you. I'm gonna do my own thing. And is Shalan about to like explore the Cosmere in book five? Is she about to go wall full on world hopper and go see everything? I kind of got that vibe. And yes, yes, I did pick up on who Thydekar is. And I won't say it here because you know, that's a, you know, a big spoiler for other things. But when I found out, I stood up and I was like, no, it can't be. And you know, I did a little bit of research online just to make sure. The fact that it was that person is probably the most exciting Cosmere thing in this whole book. Incredible, right? Incredible. Really like, uh, unless I've missed something or like I'm just too caught up saying this video now, but I feel like there wasn't that much with Shalan and Adolin. It kind of set up what they were doing in the next book. Yeah, it was great to see Shalan kind of come into herself. I'm glad that Radiant is still there. I'm glad that she's still having to work through things because it would feel too neat if like Kaladin and Shalan just like fixed their mental illness because of a few key events. Like this takes time, this is gonna take a lot more time and it's good that they're healing, but I'm glad it wasn't just like a quick fix kind of thing. Yeah, fantastic with Shalan there. Okay, now the very, very last thing, <laughs> the epilogue with wit. Easily the best epilogue in any Stormlight book, in my opinion. It was just so creative and so well written and so bloody terrifying. It was terrifying to see wit meet his match in some way. Wit has been untouchable. Wit is like all knowing, 10 million steps ahead of everyone else. And just to see Taravage and like, oh, I'm gonna pluck your memories. First of all, that his memories were stored in breath was very, very interesting to me having read Warbreaker, just how the scene played out again exactly, and just seeing Tyra Virgin as Odium is freaking me out because he's like mentally unstable and what is this gonna mean? And someone in the comments asked me like, when I posted about finishing this book, like, do you think that Wit was actually playing Tyra Virgin? And I did think that for a moment, but having thought about it longer, I don't think so. I think Wit actually did get played here and outsmarted, that scares me a lot. An incredible, extremely ominous ending to the book. And I loved it, I lost my freaking mind. Like I'm playing it down here, like I was basically screaming. <laughs> this entire part, I was just like, ah! I was just screaming the whole time. Like it was 
amazing. So yeah, it seems that Shalan is going to be Miss Cosme in Shadesmar, hopefully coming back to talk with Yasna and everybody. It seems like Kaladin is going, yeah, on the mission that Dalinar sent him on, and he is he budding up with Zeth? Because if that is what I gathered, and if that is correct, hell yeah. Is the next book gonna take place over just 10 days? I don't think so. But I like that there's another countdown, like Words of Radiance. Dalinar and the Champion, Adolin, you know, coming into his own. There's too much to say here, I'm gonna go on forever, but we'll talk so much more in the comments. But yeah, overall guys, part five blew my mind. I'm sorry in advance that I probably missed a lot there, because there's just so much to talk about. Comment below, let's talk about it. Tell me what your favorite part was. Thank you so, so much. If you were reading along with me or just following along with these videos, it means so much to me. We've grown each video, more people have jumped on board. It has been so much fun to, you know, I started this channel just because I love Stormlight so much. And to think that all of you guys would take the time to read the next book along with me was so exciting and so much fun. Like I haven't been here that long. And just to know that that many people were on board you know, it meant a lot to me. So thank you so much for joining. I can finally get back to lore videos. So be excited for those. If you're interested in other things I'm reading, I just started the first lore trilogy. So grim dark, here we come. I'm pumped. Thank you for watching. Apologies for the extended outro. And I'll see you all in the next one.